Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Teresa Warner, and I am the 105th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming and events such as this, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org slash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it is not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and our public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a Q&A, and I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now I'd like to introduce our head table, and I'd ask each of you to, here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, John Seidenberg, editor for Institute for Defense Analysis. Anne Roosevelt, deputy managing editor for Defense Daily. Ben Dooley, staff writer for Kyoto News. Andrea Stone, contributor to the Huffington Post. Jim Michaels, military writer for USA Today and a former Marine Infantry officer. Captain Danny Hernandez, public affairs officer for the Chief of Naval Operation and a guest of our speaker. Donna Linewan, USA Today and former NPC president. I'm going to skip our speaker for just a moment. Jennifer Schoenberger, anchor and producer for the television show The Wall Street Report and the Speakers Committee liaison who organized today's event. Bill Holland, associate editor, editor of Platt's Gas Daily and former naval officer. Jim Noon, retired Navy Reserve Captain, National Press Club Silver Owl member, Vietnam veteran, and a member of the American Legion Post 20 at the National Press Club. Ken Delecki, freelance writer, Commander of the American Legion Post 20 at the National Press Club. John Rosenberg, Policy Advisor, Strategic Information and Communications Group. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> Admiral Jonathan Greenert grew up in a Pittsburgh suburb of Butler, Pennsylvania. The son of a steel worker, he was the third of six children. Admiral Greenert was the all-American kid growing up. He worked not one paper route, but two. He was on the swim team, student council, a member of the National Honor Society, and the Archery Club. And to top it all off, he and his buddies were also members of the Maitre d' Club, a group that offered them a way to earn a few bucks either by selling hot dogs at a ball game or waiting on folks at Rotary Club dinners. Accepted at the University of Pennsylvania, the Military Academy of West Point, and the United States Naval Academy, Greenert made the smart choice following in his footsteps of his uncle and chose the Naval Academy. There he studied nuclear power to serve as a submarine officer. Flip open the Naval Academy's yearbook from 1975 and you'll find a few tidbits about Admiral Greenert. It described him as an always colorful and almost religiously non-academic midshipman known for colorful weekends. It, in, it concludes with his personality, good looks, and quick wit, he is bound to be a success. Coming from a Navy family, I know how clairvoyant your books can be. Admiral Greenert has successfully commanded at all levels, including the USS Honolulu, where he earned Vice Admiral Stockdale Award for inspirational leadership. He has also served as Commander Submarine Squadron 11, Commander Naval Forces Marianas, Commander U.S. 7th Fleet, and Commander U.S. Fleet Forces Command. He most recently served as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Greenert is a decorated member of the Navy, having been award awarded the Distinguished Service Medal six times 
and the Legion of Merit Award four times. He is the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. Please welcome Admiral Jonathan Greenert to the National Press Club. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, you won't find all of those uh, words in my biography. I, I really do not know where Teresa got that. Oh, actually, I know where she must have got it. I thought all that was embargoed. Uh, but, uh, but thank you very much, Teresa. I'm very honored and privileged uh, to be here today, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like uh, to give a big uh, shout out to, to the pastry chef who put, made these cupcakes. Now, I'm about to burst into tears because the logo on my cupcake was my last fleet command ever until I became a bureaucrat. This is uh, very saddening in a strange way, but, but also very inspiring. And I want to thank you very much. Uh, it's been 14 months uh, in the job here, and it is, uh, it's everything they promised me uh, as I've been in this job. An amazing group of, of sailors, uh, civilians, and their families that always impressed me, always wanting to do more and work for something bigger than themselves. And uh, I've been honored to uh, lead and serve them. Uh, again, thank you for the invitation. I'd like to talk about two things today and then take some questions. Uh, one, our position, uh, what I call our position report today uh, in the Navy and since my time uh, as the Chief of Naval Operations and our rebalance to the Asia Pacific, a, a very important initiative as we work to comply with our defense strategic guidance. Our position. When I started the job, uh, again, 14 months ago, and I looked out there, uh, what, what is this going to be like here in the future? What's the, what's the sea out there? What's the channel look like? Uh, I saw the Budget Control Act. I saw the Arab Spring going on around us. Uh, Operation uh, Enduring Freedom, Afghanistan, and the changes taking place there, uh, and a new defense strategy probably on the horizon. And I said, you know, uh, I want to make sure that our folks in the Navy, uh, from the wardroom to the boardroom, to the ready room for aviators are focusing on the things that are really important. And I broke it down into kind of what I'll call three tenets, or a lens, the way to look through things. And uh, I, I brought these out, and they're still applicable today. Number one, war fighting has to be first. Uh, it has to be in our minds all the time. That is what we are put together to do. That's why this nation created a Navy, to be sure that we can assure security, and if necessary, win the wars. And, and everybody, all of our folks, are essential in that regard. War fighting is our primary responsibility. Number two, we need to operate forward. Our Navy is at its best when it is out and about, and that has been our heritage, it's been our legacy, our tradition through the years. As we celebrated the 200th commemoration of the War of 1812 during this, this past year and are still doing it uh, today. Operating forward uh, means using innovative ways to make sure that the ships that we have are where we need them to be. And that it's not just about necessarily how many ships we have, but how many ships we have forward. And third, be ready. Be ready means more than just parts, more than maintenance, more than fuel. It also means that we have confident and proficient crews that are ready to do the job and get that job done. So those tenets that I just laid out to you, those six words remain applicable today and are key to how we view things in our leadership in the Navy. Our force today, if uh, you look, uh, I've passed out some chartlets there for you to, to help you follow along to make some points here. We have about 50,000 sailors out today deployed on about 110 ships that are deployed around the world. And on the little chartlet here where it says today's Navy, uh, you'll see where in the world they are. You'll notice that about half of the ships that we deploy forward are in the Asia Pacific region. And it's been that way for about 10 years now. We've had somewhere between uh, 45 and 50 ships forward deployed in the Asia Pacific. Now about a half of those, those ships deployed in the Asia Pacific are there all the time. They're called the forward deployed naval force. And we get great leverage having a forward deployed naval force. Number one, they're there all the time. Two, they build relationships and assure allies. And three, a little factoid, to keep one ship forward from the continental United States requires four total ships. One is there forward deployed. One has just come back. One is about ready to go forward and, and in those process, or one is in deep maintenance. So if we can leverage to operate our ships forward, to keep them forward, then we get a good return on investment. If you'll, no you'll notice about a third of our deployed ships are in the Middle East, in the Arabian Gulf, 
and about a dozen plus uh, are in. Actually, today, about 18 ships are, are in the Mediterranean uh, due to the issues that we have in the Mediterranean. The key here for me, as you look here, you'll see a uh, little kind of valve signs, if you will, at the, what I call the Maritime Crossroads, the Straits of Malacca, the Strait of Hormuz, uh, the Suez Canal, the Straits of Gibraltar, and of course the Panama Canal. We have to have access, be at or have access to those places. Those are the Maritime Crossroads. That's where the lifeblood of our world economy travels through, and that's what we need to be able to maintain and sustain for the world as one of our primary jobs. So we develop also and nurture places. And you'll notice there are little squares, places like Diego Garcia, like Singapore, Yokosuka, Japan, Atsugi, Japan, uh, Djibouti, uh, and, uh, and Camp Lemonnier at Djibouti, Rota, Spain. These are places. They're not our bases. They are places where allies allow us to go and to refresh, to resupply, uh, to increase our logistics. And if you look around there, there are, these are important places for us to uh, continue our mission as we look out there in the future. And in my view, they are very important to uh, our ability to continue to, to execute the defense strategic guidance. You'll notice, uh, lastly, that there's a little box on the lower left, and it lays out for you how long it takes to get from the East Coast or the West Coast to, say, the Suez Canal to the Strait of Hormuz, and it's several days. In fact, in some cases, it's two, three weeks. If we're not forward, and ready to get the job done, then it's going to take some time. So again, operating forward is important. Now I mentioned that recently I published a position report. Uh, in the Navy, when you are about uh, out at sea, once a day you prepare for the captain what we call the 8 o'clock report. It's usually done in the morning or the 12 o'clock report. Choose to do it at noon. It's the position report. It's a fix and it just says, here was our voyage today, captain. Here is where we are. And some things may have occurred. We may have been set off of our course due to wind, due to current. And I published this position report to kind of lay out for the Navy where we are after my first year on the job. We've been set a little bit, if you will, on some emergent challenges since I've taken the job. And we have to adjust our course a little bit. Some things that uh, have emerged since I've taken the watch that we have to focus on right now in the near term. One, sexual assaults. Um, I'm troubled that, that we haven't moved forward to, to limit and, and really reverse the trend of these events during my time here. Uh, for me, sexual assault is a safety issue. Uh, our sailors, as they serve, of, of all genders, everybody deserves a safe place to work, and it's a safety and readiness issue for me. Um, we need to focus on it. We have a strategy. We are moving out on it, and it will receive my attention, my full attention. Uh, over this next year. We have to treat it as a crime because that's what it is. Next, suicides. We've, we've had um, concern uh, on a creeping kind of increase in the number of suicides that we've, we've had in the Navy. Uh, we measure it by number of suicides per 100,000 uh, so that we have a, a consistent measurement. And regrettably, a few years ago, we had about 13 suicides per 100,000. Um, now it's 15 per 100,000, so we're creeping up. Uh, and uh, we have to address it. We have to empower our sailors to be able to deal with stress. We have to look out for each other, and we have to imbue and embed that in all of our shipmates to make sure that if somebody is reaching out, we're ready to take care of them. Third, op tempo uh, has been a little higher than I expected uh, at this time a year ago. Um, we're, we're operating higher than planned, and uh, we need to reconcile how we can continue to support that. Right now, we are committed to providing two carrier strike groups in the Arabian Gulf through March. That's, we've been doing this since 2010, and we're committed to that, as I said, through uh, this March. We need to take a look at that, and we will be, uh, with the joint staff and the service to see, uh, do we need to continue this? Uh, what do we need to do to adjust our training, if necessary, our industrial base, and our maintenance processes to be sure that we can, uh, that we can respond as necessary? We need to look at our op tempo from the perspective of our people. And uh, we call that individual tempo, I tempo, which is a measurement of, of what each sailor's requirements are going to see coming back and in rotating out as opposed to the unit. Uh, and I think it's important for the health of our force that we continue to do that. And lastly, manning at sea. Our manning overall 
is acceptable. I'm, I'm satisfied with that. But uh, the leadership skills in certain uh, billets, on certain positions, on certain ships has to be adjusted to make sure we get that right so that as we respond to the increased op tempo, uh, we've got the right leadership in the right place at the right time. And we'll pursue that. During this uh, past year, I've done some studies and found that uh, there's a few initiatives that uh, I may not have thought about a year ago, but they're important. We want to make the electronic magnetic spectrum uh, and cyber a primary warfighting domain. Uh, we need to, we'll be accelerating our effort in this regard. And it goes something like this. I had some folks take a look and say, wh what frequencies are we using in the electronic magnetic spectrum? Uh, how much energy are we putting on out there? Are people measuring it? And do we know what we need to know about that? And the answer was, you know, we did a pretty good job at this at one time during the Cold War. Some of you may remember a mission control, and that was a consistent effort that we had. Uh, but not so much now because, frankly, we just haven't had to do that. So we need to do what I guess I would call take care of our electromagnetic hygiene to, to know how much energy we're putting out there uh, that is being picked up, if you will. How much, uh, what frequency band? Why do we use the frequencies we do? Can we hop frequency as we build new systems? Because it'll be important, because a lot of our potential adversaries and, and a lot of new systems are coming in that measure exactly that, um, our emissions. So electronic magnetic spectrum is important. We need to sustain the undersea, our dominance in the undersea domain, and that's continuing a networked approach. It's important to have submarines. They are a main part of dominance in the undersea domain. But it's also a matter of having systems. It's, it's P-8 aircraft uh, with sonar buoys. It's surface ships with appropriate sonars and towed arrays. It's fixed systems on the bottom, and it's unmanned underwater vehicles that are, can be autonomous. And, and we're not far from being able to deploy just all those systems. And we'll continue to develop in field an, an integrated unmanned aerial system to operate from a carrier. This next year, here, here in fiscal year 13, we'll do a demonstration of an unmanned vehicle from a carrier and recovered that we'll be able to use that system. Uh, that will lead us to building a system that we can operate within our air wings and provide that persistence, maybe support logistics, because if you don't have all the systems that support the pilot, that's weight, extra weight, extra payload, extra systems, extra capability. Uh, and that will be a f uh, an important part of our future. A few words about our rebalance to the Asia Pacific. In our defense strategic guidance, which was released just about a year ago, it was clear to us that we, were, we needed to rebalance, if you will. We were directed to rebalance to the Asia Pacific while sustaining appropriate capability in the Middle East. Uh, it's been a long, the Asia Pacific has been a long time focus for the U.S. Navy. Five of of uh, our seven treaty allies are in the Pacific. Six of the top G20 economies and the largest armies in the world are in the Asia Pacific. So it makes sense that we would do that. As I've shown you or mentioned uh, on our graphic there, 50, about, about half, 50 ships, about half of what we deploy annually are in the Asia Pacific and a half of those are home ported there. So in an important area, um, typically, we measure when we make changes and we rebalance, we measure it by ships. But I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's more than ships. It's really about capability, and there's much more to this rebalance than ships. How will we rebalance? Four ways. One, it will be force structure. It will be ships. And if you look on your chartlet, you, you'll, see the, uh, you'll see the tomorrow picture, if you will, the, the Navy tomorrow, and you'll see a listing from fiscal year 13 to 17 to 20, how we will migrate, how we will evolve our ship count to the Asia Pacific and to the Arabian Gulf and other areas around the world. Now, how do we, if you will, it's not creating ships. Again, it's operating forward in innovative ways that make sense. We'll have new ships coming in, the literal combat ship, which will deploy and operate forward and will rotate the crews. That will free up some of our larger surface combatants, our destroyers, to be able to deploy elsewhere. We'll bring on what's called the joint high-speed vessel, a catamaran, high-speed 30-plus knots, 35-plus knots with a helo deck to take care of some of the missions that we have amphibious ships doing today, say in the Southern Command, in African Command, in the European Command. Again, freeing up amphibious ships to deploy elsewhere. 
we'll bring on what's called the afloat forward staging base, an auxiliary-like ship, actually it built from the, the basics of a tanker, uh, and the centerpiece put in with it, you can ballast up and down, and with that fuel, a flight deck, and an opportunity to deploy a lot of rotary wing, bring comfort, do HADR, uh, do perhaps special operating force, and we're bringing the afloat forward staging base in. Again, that will free up amphibious ships to do other jobs in other parts of the world. So as we bring on perhaps ships that more, more likely resonate with some of the missions we need around the world, we'll be able to redeploy and redistribute our forces uh, around the world, our ships, and rebalance to the Asia Pacific. I tell you, a key to this uh, is a recent initiative where the government of Spain offered us the opportunity to forward deploy, put the ships and families in the road of Spain four of our Aegis-class DDGs, top-notch ballistic missile defense capability for the, the defense of Europe. As I mentioned before, they will be there in theater, and remember what it takes, four to one. We have four there all the time. So it will effectively free up, all told, six ships to redeploy elsewhere that we would normally send in Europe. So more presence to the Asia-Pacific through force structure. That's number one. Two, we will base more ships and aircraft on the West Coast. As our ships retire through the remainder portion of this decade, uh, we will replace them on the West Coast such that by 2020, uh, we'll have 60% of our ships on the West Coast or the Pacific home ported and 40% on the East Coast. Today, it's 55% West Coast, 45% East Coast. So that's number two. And number three, we're fielding new capabilities in our rebalance to the Asia Pacific. Guided by the air-sea battle concept of operations, uh, we'll increase capabilities in the undersea. As I mentioned before, distributed systems, autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, we will also bring on a networked undersea uh, capability uh, to connect and, make, and cover larger, broader areas. We'll bring in the P-8, which is a replacement for our P-3 maritime patrol aircraft vastly increasing the ASW coverage in the undersea domain. In the surface area capability-wise, we'll bring improvements in our anti-ship cruise missile capability to be able to detect further out cruise missiles and be able to therefore engage them further out. Anti-ship ballistic missile to counter that capability, uh, we'll have that in our surface capability there in the Western Pacific. And in air, we'll have improved air-to-air. -air. We're bringing in the Joint Strike Fighter she will deploy to the Western Pacific first. And with her will be an improved weaponry, improved radar to extend our range. And lastly, number four, in, in our rebalance, we'll be developing partnerships and what I call a rebalance of intellectual capital. Uh, we'll expand and mature our alliances in the Western Pacific, and we've got a foot up on that today. As we speak, uh, in Japan, our, our folks, our operations folks at the 7th Fleet, and at the uh, Commander-in-Chief Self-Defense Fleet for Japan are co-located in the operations area for certain operations. Uh, in Japan, uh, excuse me, in Korea, the same exists. We are co-located with our brothers and sisters in the Republic of Korea Navy. Uh, in Singapore, the Singapore government and military have offered us uh, a site which, where we can operate joint task exercises, uh, do humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, uh, operations there in Changi in Singapore using the port and a facility there. So our partnerships are maturing, our partnerships are growing in the Western Pacific. We do 600 events from staff talks to major exercises uh, in, in the Western Pacific and we do 170 ship, ship to ship exercises a year. We will continue to mature those uh, and work those up. Intellectually and strategically at our war college, as we bring our students on, we'll be focusing more on the Western Pacific as a benchmark. We have to, again, again retain our capability that's needed in the Arabian Gulf and, and what is needed there, but our focus, our benchmark, will remain and will be the, the, the Western Pacific. And we'll, sh we'll sharpen, excuse me, our focus and the capabilities needed in the Western Pacific, looking at doctrine, looking at uh, what is needed uh, in the future for systems, for R&D, for science and technology. The benchmark will be that which is needed in the Western Pacific. So there's a, really a whole panoply of, of means by which we will rebalance. Ships are important and they are a good measure, 
but there's so much more uh, as we look toward the future and, and we meet the requirements of our defense strategic guidance in this regard. So having laid that out, uh, I commend that to you as our future uh, and how we see things today uh, as we prepare our budget for uh, fiscal year 14. Uh, it's to support just this very effort that I mentioned to you. I think we're on track and prepared to meet our national security commitments in this regard and the defense strategic guidance. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Your article in Foreign Policy speaks to balancing the force. How do international navies play into your strategy? The uh, international navies play into the strategy uh, really by mission, uh, I think, and by alliances that we've had. And, and let me speak uh, to the alliance. I just spoke to the Western Pacific. Uh, the, uh, the, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force uh, plays a, the, we cooperate with them to share uh, what we call long-range um, uh, search and track uh, mission there in the uh, Western Pacific in there. Uh, what the navies of the uh, Republic of Korea uh, have shown an interest to continue to do that in a similar manner. So alliances that we have, we're taking those and, and we're evolving the missions that we may want to cover uh, in that regard uh, to do that. With regard to counter piracy right now in the Gulf of Aden, uh, alliances play a major, major part Part. Uh, we have a coalition maritime force, it's called 151, in the Gulf of Aden, which has been led by Pakistan, it's been led by Bahrain. Uh, actually, the, the Iranian Navy takes part, not in the coalition, uh, they're in, operating with us, but in that area. The Chinese operate in that area, the Russians operate in that area. Not necessarily in a coalition, but in the sense of, uh, with alliances we share this, but also it, it brings together an international community that has a common concern. As tensions between China and Japan over their claims on the Senkakis increase, how concerned are you about the possibility that a miscalculation by either side might lead to heightened conflict? Well, if, uh, if I were to pick a word uh, to describe the concern, it is exactly that. It is, it is a miscalculation uh, causing uh, escalation. I think the key here is a common set of protocols uh, to, to deal with interactions in that area. Uh, I've spoken about this with uh, my counterpart uh, in the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, the Singapore Navy, uh, and the Philippines, and we all agree that what we need are a consistent set of protocols laying out very clearly where we stand, freedom of navigation and in international waters. A uh, consistent set of protocols about how we describe that and discuss that with any two, uh, any navies uh, in that area. Uh, with regard to China in that regard, I, I believe we need to continue the dialogue and build upon the dialogue that, that we have today. Uh, we have a, a system or a series of talks uh, that are sponsored by the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, an agreement reached years ago where a group of 06s from uh, the, the uh, Chinese Navy and the U.S. Navy sit down and discuss common set of uh, agenda items. Uh, that has been expanded to a plenary session where now flag officers, uh, junior admirals sit down and discuss that. Uh, we in the Department of Defense have now a, a deliberate uh, strategy for engagement uh, with the Chinese military and, and I think it's important, Teresa, that we continue on that uh, as, again to be sure and clear where we stand and then we can work on the issues at hand. What is the biggest challenge presented by China's growing naval strength? I think the, uh, the biggest uh, challenge is understanding the intent, uh, understanding the, uh, the strategy that uh, China uh, intends to, to unveil, if you will, in, in that regard. Uh, they're making great headway uh, in, uh, on, in surface ships. They're making great headway in uh, tactical aircraft. Uh, and it appears they have a definite interest in, in improving their uh, submarine technology. But I think the, the biggest challenge for us will be to continue the dialogue uh, and to learn how to, uh, to operate together in a cooperative manner in areas that are important for uh, freedom of the seas, areas important for economic development, both in the Western Pacific and, in, and in, if they choose to expand operations, as they have, like I mentioned, in the Gulf of uh, Aden. Uh, for the common good, if you will, of, and security in all the oceans. 
You speak of maturing alliances in the Western Pacific. Can you talk further about the movement of Marines from Okinawa to Guam, Australia, and Hawaii? Well, I can speak uh, to, uh, that's really probably better suited for the, the Commandant, but uh, it is clear that the footprint of Marine uh, in, in the Western Pacific uh, is changing and is going to change. Uh, that lay down is, is described and will uh, evolve from Okinawa toward Guam and also in a, de, uh, in a rotational deployment aspect to Australia. Our job will be to provide the maritime lift for Marines uh, who will rotationally deploy uh, to Darwin, Australia. Um, today there are about 250 Marines exercising with the uh, Australians. Uh, that will grow, it will double and grow until toward the end of the, of the decade, by 2020, we'll have uh, a Marine Expeditionary Unit sized, about 2,500 rotationally deploying there. Our job will be to bring an amphibious ready group uh, to bear at that time to provide the lift and provide them the means of working together to operate in the Southeast Asia region. How close are the Chinese to our Navy-based nuclear ca capabilities, and should the U.S. be worried? Well, the, the Chinese do have uh, nuclear submarines uh, today. It's, uh, uh, I would say that uh, it's very difficult bringing on a nuclear program. We certainly learned that uh, throughout the years. Uh, I'd say uh, vigilant. Uh, is where I would say uh, the, is the right term. Uh, worried is uh, not quite yet. Uh, I am very confident in our ability to operate wherever we need to in the undersea domain. Can the U.S. Navy build and maintain the fleet required by the pivot to the Pacific? Today, uh, in the Defense Strategic Guidance, uh, there are a set of attributes, a set of missions that we are required to bring forward. Uh, this is all underwritten by what we call the Global Force Management Allocation Plan. It is really my covenant with our global combat commanders to what we need to provide worldwide. And I am comfortable today that uh, today and that in the future, as shown by the chartlets that I've seen you, as we evolve to operate forward using the innovative means and with the current shipbuilding plan, that we can meet the requirements of the Defense Strategic Guidance. Will the U.S. return to old bases in places such as the Philippines? That's a good question uh, that is under uh, deliberation and uh, consultation right now with the Philippine government. Today we, we operate from, uh, some of you remember Clark Air, Air Base, Clark Air Force Base at one time, and we fly with uh, Philippine Armed Forces on what we call maritime domain awareness flights uh, with our P3s. They have crew members on board. We do this about once a month. Uh, we still make port calls to Manila. We just, George Washington was there not that long ago, uh, as was the uh, Eisenhower, I believe it was. Uh, we, had a, we had a nuclear carrier visit there. And we somewhat routinely make port calls there. But I think uh, to, to return to a base uh, requires a series of of uh, uh, deliberations, if you will, uh, that we have to work out. Status of forces agreement, which is expired, would have to uh, be renegotiated. Uh, and it would require a long-term commitment. But, but those are under discussion. Can you elaborate on how the law of the Sea Treaty would assist you or impact you with respect to ongoing confrontations in the China Sea? Yes, I think, uh, well, I'm a proponent. I support uh, Law of the Sea Treaty, and particularly in, in case of the South China Sea and its area, it would, it would give us a document, a reference, to continue these, as I mentioned before, dialogue that we have uh, with the Chinese Navy and with the Chinese military, uh, a reference to, that would clearly articulate things like uh, what, what international um, e exclusive economic zones, how they are laid out, uh, territorial seas, how they are laid out, freedom of navigation, and, and what those protocols are, and that we could then continue the dialogue using, again, a, a common document both nations have uh, signed up to and ratified. Uh, we've already seen some examples uh, of countries, Southeast Asian countries, uh, Vietnam, uh, and the Philippines worked out using the Law of the Sea Treaty the means to determine territorial uh, and resolve, in some cases, territorial disputes in there, uh, or at least clearly lay them down so then you can have a trail uh, and a path to further deliberations to solve it. 
The first mobile landing platform has been assigned to Central Command. Will future MLPs be assigned to Pacific Command, and what are the merits of such prepositioning? Well, the, the precise assignments for the mobile uh, landing platform uh, are not complete yet. Uh, I would tell you it will certainly deploy to the Pacific Command because what it brings, the mobile landing platform, again, remember, as I described it, it's a, a former tanker. Uh, the, the engine room and the, the hull shape is a large tanker, but then the insert instead of tanks uh, are, is space, volume, that you can ballast down, that you could then bring landing uh, air cushion craft on board, that you could bring small boats up to. So it's, it's volume, it's persistence, it's major fuel and, and uh, maintenance support that you can bring to bear uh, for a long time at various places around the world. Uh, we see African Command and Southern Command and some elements of Central Command to be key, as, uh, as you mentioned, Teresa, already we're seeing the payback in the Central Command for the, uh, for the uh, float forward staging base. The carrier Eisenhower, one of four deployed carriers, is on a nine-month deployment. Given the Iraq-Iran-Afghanistan situation and the new emphasis on the Western Pacific Theater, when do you expect carriers to get back to a six-month deployment? Well, I don't think six-month deployments uh, are in the, f in the future for, I would say, the next two or three years, uh, at least. Uh, and the reason is uh, twofold. Uh, one, the requirements for deployment around the world. Uh, as we see at the Global Force Management Allocation Plan that, that we've signed up to. Uh, secondarily, we need 11 carriers uh, to do the job. Uh, that's been pretty clearly written and it's underwritten in our defense strategic guidance. Uh, we have 10 carriers today as the Eisenhower returned from her last deployment just a week ago and she is uh, getting ready to decommission. The Ford will come into being a, a, and commission around uh, 2015 and we hope to get her on deployment about a year plus later. So as we migrate from 10 toward 11 carriers, our real requirement, uh, we're looking at probably closer to on the norm about a seven month deployment to seven months in a week for our carriers. Each of our ship classes have a different level, if you will, of, of notional deployment. Uh, some folks uh, kind of group it together on the carriers that that's what all of our ships do, but six months remains notional for our uh, for our submarines, six months remains notional for some of our maritime patrol aircraft crews and some of our other classes of ships, but uh, seven months is more notional, I think, in the, uh, in the, for a notional skill, if you will, or a notional term for our carriers in the future. With the current carrier up tempo and cost and time to build a new carrier, why didn't the Navy extend the Enterprise for another five years? Uh, why did the... Why didn't they? Why didn't we? Uh, Enterprise is uh, almost 51 years old, and uh, any, uh, anything from the cabling uh, was degrading, uh, just the insulation on the cabling that was, that was so old. Um, her, her reactor plant was built for so many, uh, so many years of operation, and so after, after numerous and very, very close and comprehensive evaluation of, uh, from the reactor plant uh, to the propulsion plant to the auxiliaries, to the flight deck, uh, I think you get the point. Uh, she was tired, and it was time for the Enterprise to complete her service. The littoral combat ships are requiring more shore-based maintenance than originally planned. Is this sustainable? Well, the littoral combat ship is uh, a still uh, a program that is coming into its being. We have really one ship, the Freedom, uh, who has been operated in somewhat of a routine. Uh, she does require a bit of maintenance, and we're learning a great deal about what exact maintenance scheme we will want. What will be the balance of using what we call organic, or, or you might say typical Navy means of doing maintenance today versus using a contractor for maintenance. And so as, as we speak today, I have, uh, I stood up a, a literal combat ship council, uh, and I placed a senior three-star admiral uh, in charge, uh, Admiral Hunt, who used to be uh, he commanded the, uh, he was the type commander, if you will, the surface force commander, knows a lot about the literal combat ship. And what we want to do is get in place uh, very quickly, uh, what kind of plan maintenance does the ship need? What will be its maintenance plan? What will be the maintenance scheme? Uh, how much do we operate it? Uh, is the, do we have the manning about right? Uh, and he has a, a pretty high level group and comprehensive group looking at this uh, so we can respond 
and, and bring that class in like it needs to be brought in because it'll be a very, very important part of our future. The GAO in a September 21st, 2012 report said that the Navy's training and maintenance plans were vulnerable. What is your reaction? Uh, our training and maintenance plans, uh, well, always need review. Um, I don't know what, I'd have to understand the context, and I'm not familiar with the context of that specific report. Uh, but we are constantly reviewing uh, better ways to do maintenance, better ways to do training. Uh, particularly in our surface fleet, uh, we have done a very big round turn at studying what are the maintenance requirements on our surface ships, our amphibious ships, destroyers, our cruisers, patrol craft, mine countermeasure ships, in order to assure that all of those ships will reach their expected service life and we get what the American public should get for the cost of the ship. Why are men and women at the Naval Academy wearing the same covers? And are you planning to move it from the Academy to the whole fleet? <laughs> Interesting question. The, uh, we have a, a pilot, uh, and it was uh, like uniforms are designed to be as uniform as they can be, as it makes sense. So what we have in place is a, merely a pilot uh, so that, uh, again, the, the folks, the male and female uniform, uh, to see if it may, the same hat makes sense. And we're using the, uh, the Naval Academy merely as a pilot. Can we get an update of NavFit 98? Well, I'm afraid you won't get it at this forum, but uh, NavFit98, that's a good question. I think I'll have to take that back, and uh, I'll send you a report on that. <laughs> What's the future role of the carrier? Well, the carrier, uh, I wrote an article a while back uh, that was called, uh, as I was looking at platforms and how platforms have evolved, how we buy things and put so much money into them, and how well do they evolve? Uh, and are we getting our money's worth? And if, if one looks at the Enterprise, when she was built over 50 years ago, the type of aircraft that she used, the type of, she had vacuum tubes in her radars, you know, for any of you, what is a vacuum tube? Well, she just completed deployment where she employed the, the most cutting edge strike fighter that we have. She had the cutting edge radar, uh, and she was the, the ship on the point supporting operations in Afghanistan for supporting for our troops. And so I think the future of the carrier uh, is it has volume, it has persistence being nuclear power, it certainly has speed, it certainly has the ability to employ a whole panoply and, and myriad of aircraft, and I spoke earlier about bringing unmanned aircraft to the carrier. So uh, I think uh, it's almost the imagination uh, can, can expand on what we can do with the aircraft carrier uh, given it has persistent speed, of volume, and tremendous capability today. If we need less ships, will they be replaced with smarter ones? Uh, smarter ships in the context, uh, if, if it is the context, uh, reduced manning and more efficient uh, fuel and uh, better sensors, uh, yes, we will, we will definitely. Uh, will we need less ships? Uh, we should think of the, of the number of ships that we need based on what capability the ship brings uh, for what mission and at what parts of the world and for what portions of the future and what, what threat it may, may deal with. I, I think that's a better evaluation. But one cannot make any mistake that you need a certain number of ships. Um, as I say, quantity does have a quality uh, of its own. And uh, as I've showed on, on my handout here, uh, it's not just the number of ships, it's the number of ships forward and at what type and what capability for what mission in, in around the world. How has the force structure changed over the past year and can you give us your thoughts on shipbuilding today and in the future? Well, in the past year, we've, we started the year at 285 ships and we've grown to 287 ships. Now, there hasn't been only a change of two. That's the net change. Uh, the good news is we have the last six ships that we have commissioned, that we have uh, accepted in the Navy from industry, have been under budget or on budget, uh, and, they have, and it has been uh, ahead of time or on contract time. Uh, and that includes a nuclear two nuclear submarines. It includes an auxiliary. 
It includes an Arleigh Burke destroyer. It includes a literal combat ship. Uh, so I think maybe you can see many different classes of ships. Uh, we are the recipients most recently on what, what can happen when you have a predictable, stabilized shipbuilding budget. Industry has the opportunity to make a profit and, and to reinvest that, if you will, to hone their skills with their labor force because they have a predictable labor force. And a lot of that is on us to make sure that I bring and, and, and that my staff brings forward uh, requirements that make sense and that we can sit down and where it makes sense do a multi-year multi procurement that is buy things in an economic quantity. And this past year has been a reflection of what can happen uh, as we've grown and gotten things on time uh, or early and on budget or early and quality where, where the builders trials have gone quite well with our ships. How have female submariners performed so far and is the Navy happy with that performance? Yeah, in a word I would say exceptional uh, performance. Uh, the, the anecdotal uh, feedback, if you will, and the consistent feedback uh, is that uh, the females that have in integrated on, where they're integrating is on our SSBNs, our ballistic missile uh, submarines uh, down in Kings Bay, Georgia. Uh, they've gone on patrol now. Um, at least three crews, and that would be 12 uh, four, uh, per ship on deployment, uh, they stand watch. They stand watch very well. Uh, a measure of a junior officer's skill and performance is who is chosen to be the engineering officer of the watch when you have an inspection when you return from patrol. Uh, and on two of these ships, uh, one of these women were, were selected to do that. And I think that's a pretty good reflection uh, of their dedication, the ability to integrate quite well with the crew, and the ability of the crew to support. Uh, so this is going quite well, uh, and I, I think we uh, will continue uh, in a similar manner with, uh, on a nice trajectory. More than 20 commanding officers have been relieved this year. What does the Navy intend to do to remedy this high rate of firings? Yes, uh, I tell you, the, uh, when one thinks about how we, why we are replacing commanding officers. Uh, there are four basic categories uh, as to why a commanding officer has tended to fail. One, uh, a grounding or an untoward incident, grounding or a collision. Two, regrettably, just incompetence, not, not cut out to be a commanding officer. Three, uh, unable to deal perhaps with the stress and one might become abusive, overbearing. And then four, uh, misbehavior, such as a, uh, a DUI, uh, an adulterous affair or something of that nature. And by a factor of at least two to one, as you look at these, uh, these 20, uh, it's been misbehavior. And so uh, I don't understand uh, why they are misbehaving and I'm concerned about that and I'm, I'm looking into that, looking into it very hard. Um, what we need to do and what we've been doing uh, in this regard is, is one, evaluate our performance in, in being able to develop and nurture our commanding officers. And we did that in 2004 with a, a Navy IG uh, review that took place. We did it again in, in 2010. And we are implementing the findings in the, in the 2010 uh, report that we had out there. And so you've got to, I think, evaluate that. Number two, we're rebaselining. And what I mean by that is, or I should say baselining, making sure that our track, our, the way we nurture our officers as we bring them along, the way we screen them for command, it's consistent across the Navy, whether you fly, whether you're in surface ship submarines, whether you're a CB, or, or whether you're an information dominance corps, that, that there's a consistency to the screening process and the evaluation process uh, so that we see that, that we're taking into account those matters and we're, that we're also developing the character of our officers as they go grow up and, and, and they inherit actually more stress, more responsibility. Uh, that's important. Uh, lastly, we want to shape them. We want to take what we learn from these reports and embed that in our leadership continuum and shape our officers to make sure that, that the character that they have is that the character uh, of the commanding officer that the American people deserve. Uh, in the end, as to get command of any Navy unit, it's unique. Uh, and it's unlike any, any other command uh, in the Department of Defense. And uh, I've, I'm a firm believer in what we call the charge of command, that this individual has a, resp a unique responsibility, has unique authority, 
and therefore has the accountability that they owe the people of the country. How will the Petraeus Allen scandal affect the Navy's officer selection process and training methods? Well, I don't think uh, it'll affect the officer training process, uh, selection process. I can't imagine it. I'd have to give that some great thought. But we have been uh, introspective uh, as a result of the events uh, in the past week. Uh, we, the, the service chiefs, uh, looked, uh, looking in at ourselves and talking with the chairman, and we're going to have a tank, what we call tank. It's a meeting of the service chiefs with the chairman and the vice chairman next week and sit down and talk about uh, what's, what are the attributes, what took place here, uh, what matters, what are the facts involved with this, um, how do we view ethics and accountability and, and behavior, uh, and where might there be weaknesses as we look across our four-star ranks and our respective services in the joint community, and then look internally to be sure that our flag and general officers, we are leading them properly. And as I just mentioned on commanding officer character and behavior, are we, are we developing character right? Are we assuring that we're looking at ourselves as closely as we would want to look at our subordinates and bringing that all together? Should adultery that does not involve a senior subordinate relationship still be punishable by the UCMJ? Well, today I will choose not to uh, question the UCMJ. Uh, it is the UCMJ, uh, and so I think it is, uh, I don't think, I know it is my responsibility to carry it out. The military has been on the forefront of social change over the years, such as race and gender equality, expectation that persons on the job be drug and alcohol free, and most lately, gay rights. Can you anticipate in which way the military will again lead the way in social justice social justice in the future? Well, to me, the, uh, the subject is diversity. And to me, uh, we have to have a diverse force, and it's all about survival. We must go mine where the talent is. We have to have the talent. And that involves, uh, if you will, ethnic diversity. It involves gender diversity. It involves sort of geographical diversity, kids from all around the country. And, and what they bring in their unique area and professional diversity. Some folks uh, brought together with a different view, it's good for the institution. Uh, to me, we've got to get the recruiting right. We've got to go out and, as I said, go mine those skills and bring them in. Today, about one out of four folks in high school qualify to be recruited into the Navy, only one out of four. Uh, and so you can try and picture that in the future. I can't tell you that's going to expand or get less, uh, but that's our challenge. So I think we've got to recruit properly, and then we've got to develop those that we recruit. And if it's uh, somebody that may be, a, if not a minority, somebody that isn't used to doing what, is what we do in the maritime forces, encourage them to, to see that they can do this. If somebody wants to fly, you can fly. You know, give it a try. If a woman wants to have a family and have a Navy career, it has been done. We have great role models to see that that can be done, et cetera. And then I'm working very hard, and I think it's important that our leadership understand that diversity has to be sort of institutionalized. It has to be uh, kind of a second nature aspect when you go out to, to hire, when you go out to recruit and pull people in. You've got to think diversity, and because you bring diversity, you bring great value. The Secretary of State and Defense have visited Vietnam. How important is Vietnam to the U.S. strategy, and will you visit? I hope to visit uh, Vietnam. It's, uh, I'm going to uh, the Asia Pacific next year, and uh, that, is, that is one of the, the places that I, I hope to visit. Uh, Vietnam is key. Uh, geography is important. Uh, they have offered uh, the ability, uh, or at least to talk about uh, maybe perhaps opening, increasing the number of port visits. We, we do a port visit in Vietnam. Uh, I can't say exactly how many times a year uh, Pacific Command uh, kind of uh, co coordinates that, but it's happening with, with our ships. Uh, we are increasing cooperative uh, opportunity. They have joined some exercises, particularly in search and rescue, and uh, like I said before, some of the maritime security aspects that are, that are so important. So uh, there's an opportunity here. And it will be a matter of moving forward, I think, at a, uh, at a rate that 
that we need to do to respect their sovereignty and respect uh, where they stand in their security matters. What does downsizing of the Navy mean for global security as well as our allies that count on us for an added layer of security? Well, the, uh, if, as you look on the, the chartlet that I gave you, we will grow uh, the Navy from roughly 287 today to 295 ships by 2020. Uh, downsizing may refer to personnel, and frankly, we're not downsizing. Uh, we are growing uh, over, the, over the years in the number of, of personnel. So one, the ship count is going up, and the number of people uh, are going up. Uh, frankly, we, we did some, uh, some efficiency methods recently uh, in, in the, about the 20, 2005, 2006, and we cut too many people out of some areas that, that we thought we could. And we're restoring that from uh, billets at sea to some maintenance billets ashore, roughly 2,000 here, so that we have a nice, rich seashore rotation so kids can develop their skills ashore and then return back to sea uh, that much better. What's your sense of whether the Iranians would shut down the Strait of Hormuz, given the crippling sanctions the West has imposed and that 80 percent of Iran's revenue comes from oil? Well, it's difficult to say uh, whether the Iranians will uh, attempt to shut down the Strait of Hormuz. Um, I'm confident that we have the capability to uh, open the Straits of Hormuz, uh, should they be, if you will, shut down. We've made some great strides in countermine warfare uh, over the past year due to uh, some reprogrammings we did, increase in emphasis on the skill. And in fact, uh, just a few months ago, we did an international mine exercise. Uh, and it was, it was a pretty good success. We were able to test new technology, autonomous underwater vehicles for finding mines and neutralizing mines. Uh, we brought an international coalition together. We'd hoped to get about 20 countries there. We had 35 countries uh, take part in this exercise. 20 of them brought ships or, or helicopters uh, or the means. We used the afloat forward staging base that we mentioned before as, if you will, the flagship, the command ship for the coalition operations. And so we learned a great deal. We learned that uh, there's a lot of synergy that we can bring together. We learned that unmanned underwater vehicles do work for countermining and that you don't need a mine countermeasure ship and a large helicopter dragging a sled to clear these things out to be effective. That, in fact, smaller ships that, that some nations with smaller navies can bring to bear on this and become very, very effective participants in the mission. We are almost out of time, but before we get to the last question, I have a couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. First of all, I'd like to remind you about our upcoming luncheon speakers on December 18th. Leon Panetta, Secretary of U.S. Department of Defense, will be speaking here. Secondly, I'd like to present our guest with our traditional National Press Club coffee mug and our version of the challenge coin. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And my last question, what is your prediction for the Army-Navy game, and do you have a wager with your Army counterpart? Yes. Well, I think we'll, I think we'll win by a field goal. There's something about the Army-Navy game and a field goal, and I, I use that because I think it'll be close. Uh, you may or may not know that we, were able, we defeated Air Force earlier this, this fall. Yeah. And Army defeated Air Force. So this is for all the marbles, the Commander-in-Chief trophy. This is a big deal. Uh, yeah, General Odierno and I have made a wager. It's the same as last year. The, uh, the loser wears the, the jersey of the winning team and, and poses for a picture in front of the team. So needless to say, I have a great shot of Ray Odierno in a Navy jersey with 75 on it from last year's game. <laughs> Guess he better find it again for this year. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. I'd also like to thank our National Press Club staff, including its Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center for organizing today's event. Finally, here's a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website. Also, if you'd like to get a copy of today's program, please check out our website at www.press.org. Thank you, and we are adjourned.
editor, editor of Platt's Gas Daily and former naval officer. Jim Noon, retired Navy Reserve Captain, National Press Club Silver Owl member, Vietnam veteran, and a member of the American Legion Post 20 at the National Press Club. Ken Delecki, freelance writer, commander of the American Legion Post 20 at the National Press Club. John Rosenberg, policy advisor, strategic information and communications group. Thank you all for joining us today. Admiral Jonathan Greenert grew up in a Pittsburgh suburb of Butler, Pennsylvania. The son of a steel worker, he was the third of six children. Admiral Greenert was the all-American kid growing up. He worked not one paper route, but two. He was on the swim team, student council, a member of the National Honor Society, and the archery club. And to top it all off, he and his buddies were also members of the maitre d' club, a group that offered them a way to earn a few bucks either by selling hot dogs at a ball game or waiting on folks at Rotary Club dinners. Accepted at the University of Pennsylvania, the Military Academy of West Point, and the United States Naval Academy, Greenert made press club. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, you won't find all of those uh, words in my biography. I, I really do not know where Teresa got that. Oh, actually, I know where she must have got it. I thought all that was embargoed. Uh, but, uh, but thank you very much, Teresa. I'm very honored and privileged uh, to be here today, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like uh, to give a big uh, shout out to, to the pastry chef who put, made these cupcakes. Now, I'm about to burst into tears because the logo on my cupcake was my last fleet command ever until I became a bureaucrat. This is uh, very saddening in a strange way, but, but also very inspiring. And I want to thank you very much. Uh, it's been 14 months uh, in the job here, and it is, uh, it's everything they promised me uh, as I've been in this job. An amazing group of, of sailors, uh, civilians, and their families that always impressed me, always wanting to do more and work for something bigger than themselves. And uh, I've been honored to uh, lead and serve them. Uh, again, thank you for the invitation. I'd like to talk about two things today and then take some questions. Uh, one, our position. Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Teresa Warner, and I am the 105th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming and events such as this, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of our speaker, as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, we'd note that members of the general public are attending, so it is not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and our public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly paper. made the smart choice following in his footsteps of his uncle and chose the Naval Academy. There he studied nuclear power to serve as a submarine officer. Flip open the Naval Academy's yearbook from 1975 and you'll find a few tidbits about Admiral Greenert. It described him as an always colorful and almost religiously non-academic midshipman known for colorful weekends, it, in, it concludes with his personality, good looks, and quick wit, he is bound to be a success. Coming from a Navy family, I know how clairvoyant your books can be. Admiral Greenert has successfully commanded at all levels, including the USS Honolulu, where he earned Vice Admiral Stockdale Award for inspirational leadership. He has also served as Commander Submarine Squadron 11, Commander Naval Forces Marianas, Commander U.S. 7th Fleet, and Commander U.S. Fleet Forces Command. He most recently served as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. 
Admiral Greenert is a decorated member of the Navy, having been award, awarded the Distinguished Service Medal six times and the Legion of Merit Award four times. He is the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. Please welcome Admiral Jonathan Greenert to the National Podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a Q&A, and I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now I'd like to introduce our head table, and I'd ask each of you to, here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, John Seidenberg, editor for Institute for Defense Analysis. Anne Roosevelt, deputy managing editor for Defense Daily. Ben Dooley, staff writer for Kyoto News. Andrea Stone, contributor to the Huffington Post. Jim Michaels, military writer for USA Today and a former Marine Infantry officer. Captain Danny Hernandez, public affairs officer for the Chief of Naval Operation and a guest of our speaker. Donna Linewan, USA Today and former NPC president. I'm going to skip our speaker for just a moment. Jennifer Schonberger, anchor and producer for the television show The Wall Street Report and the Speakers Committee liaison who organized today's event. Bill Holland, associate at